Welcome to this Fireside Chat. I'm Pamela Spence. I'm the Global Health Sciences and Wellness Leader at EY. And I'm talking today with Dr. Kieran Mazumba Shaw. So, Kieran, firstly, congratulations on winning EY World Entrepreneur of the Year Award, a fantastic achievement. You're a trailblazer for business women and entrepreneurs, having, of course, built Biocon from scratch to one of India's leading biotech companies. Let's start by really hearing about your personal journey to the success that you are achieving today. I often uh, refer to myself as an accidental entrepreneur because I never planned to run a business. I went to Australia, qualified as a brewmaster, came back to India thinking I'm going to pursue a career in brewing. But I found that uh, breweries in India didn't want to have me because of my gender. And therefore, I realized that this was not going to work. And it was an accidental encounter with an Irish entrepreneur that saw me start my company. And I think that's where my entrepreneurial journey began. I started out in my garage, converted it into an office. I then realized that it wasn't just the brewing industry that had problems with women. I realized that banks didn't want to lend to me. People didn't want to work for a a woman employer. So I had a huge number of perception hurdles to overcome because I was young. I was 25. I had no business experience. I had no money. I was considered high risk and my credibility was very low. And, uh, you know, my, my journey, my entrepreneurial journey has been about building credibility. So the only thing that I was confident of was my knowledge of uh, biotech and enzymes. And I realized that most industries were very poor in understanding new technologies. And so I had an upper hand at telling them about these new technologies and how I could uh, replace some of their chemical technologies with these eco-friendly enzyme technologies that were so much more efficient. So I would say that that's how I went about creating my business. And I became very good at uh, developing new enzymes for various industry needs. And so it was a very innovation-led business that I actually you know, pursued for the first, uh, I would say, 20 years of my entrepreneurial journey. I, I always believe that for an entrepreneur, you need to have a purposeful mission. My first uh, uh, entrepreneurial phase was about greening uh, in businesses and industrial processes, because I realized that chemical processes were very polluting. And I realized that enzyme technologies could really replace them very efficiently and make them very ecologically friendly. And then my second phase was about, uh, you know, uh, making, uh, you know, an impact on global healthcare by providing affordable access to patients anywhere in the world. And that's where I started my uh, biopharmaceutical journey with insulins, because again, insulin was a very interesting opportunity for me, because I realized that India was at the epicenter of diabetes, and we were importing all our insulins, which is such an essential critical therapy for diabetes. And because people could not uh, afford recombinant human insulin, They were buying animal insulin and using animal insulin, which is quite immunogenic. So I said, well, that's not fair. And I think I must make a difference to this. And therefore, I said, let me develop a recombinant human insulin based on a platform technology that I had developed for enzymes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this platform technology was a very specialized yeast technology, uh, which actually makes us unique even today because we are the only company in the world using this technology. And today I'm proud that I'm the lowest cost insulin producer in the world. So I think if you're driven by a sense of purpose, I think it makes it all the more easy and uh, all the more worthwhile to do what you're doing. I, I think that's so important. And your drive and enthusiasm, it's incredibly inspiring listening to you. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing women today in business, particularly entrepreneurs? So, you know, Pamela, uh, I don't think too much has changed since I started my business because credibility still remains a big issue. I think uh, the investment world uh, views women in a very unfair way. They basically think we are not risk takers. We're not ambitious enough. 
Uh, we're not aggressive enough in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. And I think these are very flawed perceptions, which I think women still have to overcome. Uh, but many of us who have succeeded have actually fought these biases and prejudices by actually proving to them that this is so flawed. We've actually shown to people that we are aggressive, we are risk takers, and, uh, you know, uh, we are willing to uh, take on challenges. And we are very ambitious. At least in my own journey, I have proved that none of what they think about women entrepreneurs is true. But despite that, I think because money is in the hand of men, they are very, very biased about uh, supporting other male entrepreneurs rather than female entrepreneurs who have to try twice as hard to access that capital. And that's what I think we need to learn to fight for equal opportunities as women. I think that's a really important point that you've, you've just made, that um, it's typically men who are funding entrepreneurs and perhaps they feel more comfortable giving money to men. Um, clearly, we have to fight uh, as, as female entrepreneurs. So how do you help and encourage women in what still is seen as a traditional male-dominated industry? So obviously, I do uh, talk at many forums where I kind of keep you know, articulating the same message over and over again, saying, look, Technology is agnostic to gender. Uh, business opportunities in many ways can be agnostic to gender if you actually view it that way. And I always tell women, you know, you should not just subjugate yourself into believing that you can't do certain things or that this job is not for women. And I think even in my case, when I started my own business, uh, I was very, very angry when I was told that the brewing industry is no place for a woman. And I kept telling them that I don't agree with them. But then I just couldn't get hired. And so when I started my own business and when I basically became very successful, it is the same people who told me that I was a high risk when it came to entrusting me with management of the breweries had great respect for what I had done. So obviously I was able to then change their mind about women uh, in leadership roles. And I think it's also up to us in the corporate world to make that extra effort to uh, provide women leadership opportunities. Again, I think we're guilty in the corporate world because you want people with experience when you're hiring. And it's, it's unfair because you obviously have more men with experience than women with experience. So you tend to basically, again, skew your bias to hiring a man instead of a woman. So I think you have to make that extra effort to make sure that even if a woman is not that experienced, if she has uh, the potential of, 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 of playing that leadership role, then please hire her despite not having that experience. And I've taken those bets on people and it's worked. Uh, it's interesting. I, I often think that um, fe females just need more encouragement to apply and have a go. Um, and they internally might only think that they've really only got 60% of the attributes and experience the role requires, whereas a man who has a similar experience profile mentally feels that he's got 140% of, of the experience. I do think it's um, for our, our high potential ladies, it's a real mental battle to feel sometimes that you're equally as qualified and, and to go for, the, for those opportunities. You're absolutely right. I mean, basically, I think uh, women are at an unfair advantage because men in general feel the job is theirs. And they are far more confident when they sort of seek those job opportunities than women are. Women go with a sense of diffidence. And I think that's what needs to change. I think women have to feel far more confident. They have to say, hey, listen, I can be better than most of my male competitors. And that's the way you have to go about uh, these opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, I myself realized that even in my own business today, for a long time, I was being looked at as a maverick. I was being looked at as someone who will not succeed because she's trying to pursue this very challenging and never tried before business model. And if the most successful men in this kind of business have not 
even attempted to go down that path, why would you be so stupid to attempt it? And you're going to fail. That's what they kept telling me, that I was not going to succeed. And when I did succeed, I was like put on a pedestal and said, wow, look at her. She's shown all the men what business is all about. I mean, that is stupid because I just think it's it, you should not compare and contrast. But I think it's good for them to show that women are as capable as men to succeed. I think my advice to women is uh, believe in yourself. Uh, stop being diffident. And uh, try and uh, fight that diffidence with a sense of confidence that you are as good as anyone around you. So, so let's turn to COVID and, and the coronavirus, obviously uh, a, a, a matter on all of our minds. And, um, you know, Kieran, of course, you've, you've had direct personal experience of, of COVID. What are your views on how we can deal with the challenges the world faces from this pandemic? So having gone through uh, COVID myself and having uh, been privy to the way governments around the world are managing or mismanaging the disease, I just feel that we are doing it top down, which is really not the way of managing COVID. It is about getting every citizen to play their bit, to do their part in in managing COVID with good behavior. Now, this happens with uh, decentralized management. This happens by getting all citizens groups involved, by, you know, sort of basically creating uh, an environment of uh, all of us are in it together kind of uh, attitude. I think some countries have done this extremely well, where communities have played a very big role, where citizens groups have played a very good role, and civil society at large has played a very good role. And do you think there's a part that education um, could be enhanced and improved um, in terms of getting people to adopt all these new and very important behaviours? Because it's not one individual, it's the collective that obviously makes the difference. In the future, I think you need to spend a lot of time educating school children to understand what pandemics are all about, what hygiene and uh, cleanliness and, uh, you know, dealing with uh, disease is all about. And I think, you know, there's very interesting uh, gaming approaches to teaching young children what pandemics are all about and how they spread and how you can prevent the spread. I'm supporting one such program which was developed at Harvard and which is now being delivered to uh, you know school children in rural India. And it's a very interesting program because it teaches them through games in classrooms what pandemics are all about and how viruses spread. So I think that's the kind of education you need to give uh, to young uh, school children. That's where it starts. Why do you need to wear a mask? Why do you need to wash your hands? Why do you need to keep that safe distance? That's the way you have to go about it. And and turning now more specifically to to Biocon and um, the innovation and and R&D effort that the Biocon itself is playing a part in uh, the fight against coronavirus. Biocon has been incredibly successful. Um, What are your plans to build on Biocon's achievement in COVID and the the disease treatment um, rather than the prevention, of course, that we've just been discussing? So as a biotech company, obviously, we looked at COVID in terms of what can we do, you know, to to manage some of these challenges that COVID is throwing at us. So the first challenge was testing. You know, India as a country was beginning to see a rapid rise of cases in COVID. And we realized that we needed to test people quite fast and at scale. And we realized we didn't have enough testing kits in the country to do all of this. So the first thing we did was we started developing and uh, offering tests through our labs because these labs that do the kind of COVID testing are quite sophisticated and you need uh, levels of, you know, of, of safety and sterility because you're dealing with viruses. So we quickly uh, repurposed one of our very high-end labs uh, with a BSL-2, as they call it, biosafety level 2, uh, kind of laboratory infrastructure into uh, doling out uh, tests at large scale. 
And then many companies in India, biotech companies in India, started developing and assembling these test kits, which were few and far between those days. We could hardly do 10,000 tests a day across the country. Today, we are doing a million thanks to all these uh, collective efforts of biotech companies and labs that are delivering these tests. And unlike many countries where they take a week or 10 days to give you the test results, in India, I'm pleased to say that the maximum turnaround time is 48 hours, which is pretty efficient. Um, then uh, as a company, we said, look, uh, as we understood the disease, we realized that the biggest cause of mortality was not the virus, but what the virus causes in terms of hyperimmune response. And the hyperimmune response causes what they call as a cytokine storm. And we realized that we have a drug that was actually developed for dealing with down-regulating cytokines. Mm -hmm. And we said, hey, this could be repurposed for COVID perhaps. And so we looked at the mechanism of action. We looked at what was happening in the case of COVID and we felt it was ideally suited to do that. So what we did was we actually ran a small proof of concept clinical study and it actually proved that it is doing that job. And, you know, we did a small study where the experimental arm uh, was given the drug and all the patients actually recovered and were discharged and they came off oxygen very fast. Whereas in the a control arm where the drug was not given, we had some deaths. So it clearly showed that we were actually saving lives. Now, this is a drug that I have licensed to a US company. And so they said that, okay, if you can show us that proof of concept in India, we will run a bigger trial in the US, which can become a global trial. And that's what we are now attempting to do. So I'm quite excited with the fact that this is the only drug that works the way does you know and that gives us a very unique opportunity in covid management so i'm quite excited with the fact that we've repurposed this drug in such an amazing way and i'm and we're now really getting into the depths of science to see what else can we learn about the disease what else can we learn about this drug that can help us to actually uh, have predictive markers that can tell us that this is the exact point at which you use the drug not an approximate point. That's a fantastic example of cross-border collaboration. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've seen a lot of nationalistic tendencies in, in, in recent months. And I think this cross-border collaboration and teaming, I, I, it's, it's just fantastic to hear about. Yes, we're even going to the UK now to see if we can help with, uh, you know, Europe and UK's needs. Yeah. And we believe it's all about... Uh, bringing down the mortality rate to near zero, then you feel very confident that you can deal with the virus because it will take a while before the vaccine arrives. And until then, we have to deal with the virus with a sense of confidence that we're, it's not life and death. As long as you can prove that, I think that's what will bring the confidence back into all our lives. Switching gears slightly, um, I've heard you speak before about healthcare being India's next tech sector. What are the biggest opportunities um, you think uh, are in front of us for transforming healthcare through digital or data analytics? So I personally believe that we've been thrown into the deep end of the digital world, even though you know we were gingerly looking at it all this time, and now we feel we were we've got no option but to look at uh, a, a digital world where this whole healthcare sector is going to transform. And data has always been very important in our business, but we haven't used it intelligently. So this is forcing us to look at data and digital connectivity with patients and you know, prescribers and uh, providers of healthcare. So I think this is now uh, becoming a reality we ourselves as a company are looking very seriously at digital therapeutics. In fact, we are, we've, we've licensed a very nice digital therapeutic um, uh, you know, software uh, from a, a US FDA approved uh, entity, which we will use now to basically uh, market our insulin products where we can actually 
you know, have a software that will connect straight with the patients and the prescribers and the providers to give them data on how the diabetes is being managed. Because the better you manage your diabetes, the less is the healthcare uh, spend on, on the complications that arise out of badly or poorly managed diabetes. So that's the kind of uh, therapeutic software that will actually play an important role in the future. In addition to that, I think today telehealth has arrived. You know, in many of these uh, COVID management cases in India, when you're home quarantined, uh, you actually can actually uh, link into a tele uh, consult or a telehealth system that actually supervises you, monitors you, and, and tells you what you need to do as a COVID patient. Equally, I think when you look at a large number of patients being managed in wards of hospitals, doctors can oversee and supervise a large number of patients at one time and getting their readout, their monitor readouts on their, their, their telephones or their computers, they can actually know which patient needs urgent attention and which patient doesn't. So I think there are lots of exciting opportunities. I think devices, wearables, data that is going to track diseases and and seeing what it can give us in terms of insights. All this is happening as we speak. It's almost like trying to drink from a fire hose because there's so much happening today. I think it's incredible just picking up on your telemedicine point. Um, and I was looking at some data recently that telemedicine itself for in different forms has been around for 70 years. But it's the, the drive from the patient consumer and the demand to not be treated in a hospital, actually to be treated at home, that actually then has driven such an exponential adoption. And I think that's fascinating that it's actually the patients have demanded the telemedicine interface, although the technology itself has been around for, for a number of years. Perhaps that's going to be one of the lasting positive um, impacts that, that this dreadful virus has actually given the industry? Absolutely, Pamela. I think it goes beyond COVID. I think now home treatment, home care is going to be a big business. So I think, you know, you can actually start using hospitals for very, you know, critical specialty kind of needs. And the rest of it can be done not in, uh, you can do it at home, you know, and you can do it through telemedicine without them having to come all the way for as an outpatient. So okay. I think this is going to be a huge new way of delivering healthcare. And I'm very excited uh, in terms of what technology has to offer to transform healthcare and democratize it. Because I know in a country like India, yeah. uh, there's a huge disconnect and a, a divide between the quality of healthcare in urban India and the lack of quality of healthcare in uh, uh, rural India. And this can actually bridge that divide because I really believe that technology can play an amazing role in a country like India. Compassionate capitalism, Kieran, is a phrase I've heard you uh, mention. Can you explain what that is and what other drug companies can learn from Biocon's approach? You know, I'm driven by a mission that is about delivering affordable access to patients across the world. And in that, I believe it's about an economy of scale that can actually develop a very sustainable and profitable business. Uh, far too often, I've heard the pharmaceutical industry uh, talk about the need for high-priced medicine because they feel that uh, they need a return on their investment. But the way I look at big pharma is that they are only focused on very small markets with very small patient populations. And therefore, they don't have to bother about economies of scale. And therefore, they have to price their products so high. On the other hand, when I look at the world markets, I look at the global markets the, from the lower and middle income countries to the most affluent countries. And I feel patients in every part of the world needs access to affordable medicines. And I therefore believe that what I'm doing is compassionate capitalism because I'm looking at the needs of patients. After all, we are in a humanitarian business. It's about patients. It's about giving medicines to patients who need it, not about giving medicines to patients who can, who can afford it. 
So I think that's the difference between what I look at in terms of capitalism and what Big Pharma looks at in terms of capitalism. And, and where do you see yourself, Kieran, in, in, in five years' time? It's very difficult to be a soothsayer in terms of a five-year five horizon because things change so rapidly. But if I were to assume that all that we are doing today is going to succeed, I do see ourselves playing a significant role in disrupting uh, the uh, value chains and the, um, you know, the, the healthcare economics the world over. Because I think that's what is required today. Most economies cannot afford what it's paying for healthcare. And I think companies like ours can make, you know, make a big difference to that challenge. And we can disrupt, uh, you know, pricing, uh, you know, uh, supply chains, and we can actually make a difference to delivering on affordable access. I, I think that's so important. And, and the, the affordability question, it's not just um, emerging markets, for want of a, a better phrase, it's also developed markets as well. I mean, healthcare is becoming unaffordable and and so we do need um i would argue fairer reimbursement systems um whatever they may look like across the whole spectrum of uh, of healthcare absolutely uh, you know pamela because in fact just to give you an example the us is uh, grappling with a huge challenge of uh, insulin pricing where a large number of people who need insulin can't even afford the price at which insulin is uh, provided in the U.S. And we know what the cost of that insulin is and we want to go and disrupt that, uh, that, that, cha- that problem that they're facing in the U.S. So I think it's really about economies of scale, understanding the patient needs and the healthcare needs and health economics uh, to really make that difference. No, certainly, and and your drive and enthusiasm and ability to take things on and disrupt systems, it, it's incredibly inspiring listening to you. So in closing, and, and I've really enjoyed our discussion today, but what is the one piece of advice you would give aspiring entrepreneurs that you wish that somebody had told you when you were starting all those years ago? Well, every entrepreneur starts with an idea. And it's about shaping that idea with a sense of purpose and a huge sense of confidence that you can take it to the market. I think that's the journey you have to focus on. And you've got to believe in your capabilities to do that. That's my advice to entrepreneurs. Run with that idea and make sure that you have the confidence and the endurance to see it all the way across the finishing line. Kieran, it's been fantastic talking to you today. Um, really enjoyable. Uh, really good luck. Well, not that I think you need it at, at Biocon. And, and it's inspiring to really listen to your journey. And the enthusiasm and the passion, it certainly still lives with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. It's been a pleasure. And of course, I need all the luck even now because I have a long <laughs> way to go.